Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like first to start by thanking the, organizer, uh, the organizers today. This is a very important day as we launch as a country and government an ambitious and strategic investment plan that is much needed. So I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me on behalf of the Lebanese International Finance Executives Association to moderate this important panel. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this morning we heard from senior decision makers in government about the government's plan to launch an infrastructure investment program. And we heard about some interesting projects and attractive opportunities. This plan is strategic for the country, is ambitious, and is obviously indispensable. It is indispensable first because we as a country need to upgrade our infrastructure and invest in infrastructure. As we all know, we've had very little of such investments for the last two decades at least. But it's also indispensable because our economy is in a dire need for stimulus package and for growth. And the CIP, as it was presented this morning, is a crucial solution triggered by the government in order to stimulate economic activity and bring business opportunities to the private and the public sector and create jobs at a time where we need that. So all this is great, but as we all know as well, the public finances are in challenging situation. And the government and the public sector cannot afford, to put it bluntly, to invest and to deploy heavily in those infrastructure plans. Therefore, the solution, obviously, as we've seen in other countries, is private capital and the private sector. And as was highlighted earlier today by Prime Minister, by Prime Minister Hariri and all the other speakers. And that's why we're here today on this panel. We have representatives from various international and local institutions which are capital providers and which are needed if we want this plan to succeed. And our objective in this panel for the next 90 minutes is to hear from those institutions about their views, about what they do and how they operate, their views about uh, this ambitious program, how do they plan to support that, and obviously, what are the conditions attached to such support? And what we'd like to take away from our panel is how can we maximize the amount of capital we raise under the PPP plans for those infrastructure projects, and how can we optimize in terms of cost and uh, diversity uh, the capital support? And this is very important for the country. It's the first time we embark on such an ambitious plan the first time we embark on an ambitious plan where we use uh, private capital, therefore it will set the stage for uh, a transformation in the way our markets operate and our funding works and our economy uh, grows. So I'd like to thank everybody here for attending and our uh, panelists. Let me first start by introducing them and then we will start by a presentation by each one of the panelists uh, providing feedback about the projects, but also presenting the way they operate, and then obviously we'll open it for debate and discussion. So we have uh, to my left Mr. Saad Sabra, who is the Leb to the extreme left, sorry, uh, Lebanon country head for the IFC from the World Bank Group. Mr. Matthew Jordan Tank, head of infrastructure policy and project preparation for the EBRD, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. To my right, Mr. Jean Riachi, who's the chairman and CEO 
of FFA Private Bank. And then to his right, Mrs. Layali Abdin, senior underwriter for MIGA, the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency. And then to the extreme right, Mr. Francesco Totaro, investment officer for the EIB. So as you can see, we have uh, great representations from some of the major and most high profile organization internationally and locally who are here to uh, show their support but also share their views with the audience. So let me start first maybe with Jean because he can set the stage as uh, uh, the local uh, uh, representative of the investment community and the finance uh, community in Lebanon. So my name is Jean Riachi. I'm the CEO of FFA Private Bank and we have been advocating for investment, private investment in infrastructure uh, for uh, many months now and I'm very happy that the, the government is taking this step. I would like to thank the organizers, Iqtisad Al-Amal, the Office of the Prime Minister and I hope uh, something will be done in the future. Uh, Condrom, for the French speaking people, problematique. Conundrum. First, Lebanon needs the money to finance PPP, and this is the topic of this afternoon session. Second, Lebanon has limited available liquidity in its banking sector. Uh, it, it, maybe it is not uh, very easy when you read the papers, you see that uh, Lebanese banks are very liquid, but in fact they're not for many technical reasons. Lebanese government cannot take on more debt. I think this is obvious for everybody. And Lebanon needs foreign money to balance its deficit, especially we have a structural problem, deficit of balance of payment, and we believe infrastructure is, is one, one good way to solve the solution. In conclusion, Lebanon needs to raise private and fresh money for PPP projects. Private money, FDIs, money require one, attractive returns. Investors do not invest if they don't have the adequate returns. Second, they need proper structuring and risk mitigation. And we will talk about how we can mitigate risk, for example, with insurance policies such as the MIGA ones, adequate governance and transparent framework. All this will result in substantial benefits. Attractive return, how can we achieve them? First, we need the proper structuring and trenching. Some people want uh, low risk and lower return. Some people accept higher risk and higher return. Uh, it's, uh, we, we need different seniority levels, etc. Uh, we need favorable tax treatment in order to uh, improve uh, project returns. And we also need, of course, optimal operation and maintenance expenses. Uh, proper structuring and risk mitigation is achieved, in our view, through uh, ring fencing the assets away from any claim of any party, especially in countries like Lebanon. Uh, uh, you can have claims coming from anywhere. You really need to ring fence the assets. The segregation of ownership and operation, it's not obvious, it doesn't happen all the time, but we think it might be a good solution uh, to have ownership separated from operation. We might uh, explain more uh, later in this session. Bankruptcy remoteness, of course, and we need swift, swift out-of-court enforcement process because, as you know, the judiciary in Lebanon is not very uh, efficient. This is the least we can say. Uh, adequate governance and transparent framework is achieved through uh, uh, using properly structured SPVs and Lebanese laws allow for this. We'll explain more. Autopilot administration of the assets in case of segregation between assets and operation. Of course, no conflict of interest between owner, operator, and contractor. 
and very importantly, reporting obligations to investors, and it's better if it's required by law. Substantial benefits are, uh, we're not saying that local banks, although they don't have the liquidity, the meaning it's gonna be difficult for them to finance these projects through their balance sheet, but they have access to money and they could also play a very active role in, uh, uh, in raising money for those projects on an agency basis. And also they could participate in their balance sheet because if we use, for example, securitization, meaning it's not bilateral loans, but securities that are issued, banks, of course, can buy them for their own balance sheet. Very importantly, ensuring equal investment opportunity to local constituents. And here we're talking about what the governor was saying this morning, uh, capital markets in Lebanon. Uh, people can invest and should be allowed to invest in those projects. So again, we need to issue the proper securities. Same thing for the diaspora. How to attract the diaspora? By allowing them to invest in securities, in these projects through securities, and even preferably if these securities can be traded and held in bank accounts outside Lebanon. This is what we call Euro clearable. Uh, this will also waive the suspicion of corruption because if this opportunity is open to the public, it means that everybody can benefit and not only a small group of insiders. Ensuring the continuity of public service uh, is uh, what, uh, when we advocate for segregation between assets ownership and operation, uh, this will allow to ensure the continuity of public service in case of litigation of op uh, uh, or disagreement with the operator. I'll give you an example. Uh, we had, the, you know, those cellular companies. The, the government had to uh, negotiate the, the purchase, the, the repurchase of the assets, uh, and it, it was a lengthy process. Same thing with Suclean. I mean, uh, uh, this is a good solution uh, to, uh, uh, to alleviate this problem. Uh, we believe that reverting to structured finance to finance PPP is very much in line with the PPP law, and uh, it's even enshrined in the law under Article 16, and I think that Mr. Ziad Hayek mentioned this uh, this morning, and by the way, uh, the law itself says, the PPP law says that the financial structure of the project is also something that the High Council will look at very closely. So not only the technical uh, uh, aspects. Uh, I would like to go through a few charts. Uh, you all know that the uh, ratio of debt to GDP is, is, is very high. Uh, you know that the deficit is, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the annual deficit, budget deficit relative to GDP is above 10%, which is huge. So this is to make our case that the government cannot invest in infrastructure. Look at what happened with government is, uh, in, uh, in, uh, spending for infrastructure, almost nothing. The government did not invest in infrastructure and we are feeling the pain today we don't have the basic infrastructure. And talking about FDI, FDI are very important for the country. Uh, in the past, it went almost 50% went to the real estate sector and nothing to productive sector. We really believe that FDIs going into infrastructure are productive FDIs that will help the country's competitivity uh, uh, and long-term growth. Capital inflows, as you can see in this chart, are becoming really uh, a big issue for the country. Uh, I'll go through uh, comparisons of uh, the uh, different laws that we can use to structure vehicles to invest in uh, the projects uh, uh, under the PPP law, of course. Uh, SPVs, how do you create SPVs? You can create an SPV under law 705, which is the uh, securitization law. It is very efficient while creating uh, 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 companies under the corporate law might prove uh, very painful. How much time do we still have? We're fine, thank you. Uh, you want me to continue? <laughs> uh, 
uh, why it's not, uh, uh, it has many reasons, we will explain them to you. Okay, about equal investment opportunities, meaning uh, offering the public to subscribe into securities issued by the structure that own the projects. Uh, uh, the, the idea is to allow the general public to invest. Okay, it is very, of course, achievable through the uh, securitization law, by definition, by design. Uh, it's called securitization, meaning you issue securities. Uh, achievable, more complicated under the fiduciary law 520. Achievable uh, uh, by, uh, uh, you can issue uh, securities if you are uh, an SAL, but uh, uh, those who work in Lebanon know that there are many constraints. Uh, and, and second, the governance is not well uh, guaranteed by uh, the Code of Commerce, and, and, and certainly not uh, up to international standards. Uh, so we don't believe it's the good solution. Uh, maturity mismatching and liquidity, uh, PPP projects are long term. We said that the banks, uh, through bilateral loans, might have some issues. While if, it's, uh, if they invest in securities, they could underwrite, they could, uh, they could buy it on a, on a, uh, uh, for trading, they could sell, buy it and, and sell it to their clients and promote the security to their clients. So again, the banks can play a big role, but we believe this role uh, should be more on the uh, agency side than on the uh, balance, balance, balance sheet side. Uh, uh, just one point, for example, in the corporate law, an SAL can issue bonds for only three times its nominal capital. Mean, and, and you cannot do trenching uh, while I, uh, if you use the securitization law, you can do as many trenches as you want with all the features that you want, interest, uh, uh, guarantees, uh, seniority, whatever, which is not available under corporate, uh, co corporate law. Uh, of course, uh, attractiveness to investment diaspora securitization is much better. Uh, the enforced governance is by design in the uh, securitization law. Uh, it is not very well uh, designed for uh, uh, SALs, for example, because the minority rights, the reporting uh, obligations are not really uh, very efficient under the Code of Commerce. Uh, corruption, as we said, if the uh, investment is offered to the public through the markets, through marketable securities, uh, the suspicion of corruption will be less uh, present. While most of the, uh, uh, the, the PPPs that we've seen in the past, we've seen a small group of investors, uh, very well connected, uh, everybody is suspicious. Uh, it, it shouldn't be the case in the future. Well, I think, uh, what else, what else? Uh, okay, uh, again, uh, by using the securitization law, you can tailor the instruments the way you want. Because as you will see, we'll have many kinds of, uh, many sorts of uh, investors. We'll have the multilaterals, we'll have the development funds, we will have the general public, we'll have uh, private investors owning uh, equity and public investors owning e equities, they all have different needs and different level of uh, requirement in terms of seniority. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Don. Uh, clearly, this is, this is very helpful for us as a basically a background about the situation in the country and the need for private capital, but also uh, clearly about the need for creative instruments so that we can cater to all type of investors. And I think we all uh, uh, acknowledge, and we see it in other countries, that there is a large variety of investors, especially in Lebanon, where there's a big pool of capital available to fund investment projects. We just need to cater to them properly. Anyway, uh, let me just pass it to Matthew for the uh, EBRD, and Matthew will uh, give us 
the perspective of the EBRD as a major institution who has a strong track record in supporting infrastructure and development projects uh, and who clearly uh, is looking at the Lebanese uh, program uh, with interest. I hope. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, it's a real honor uh, to address this um, audience about a very important topic. Um, I um, am the manager of our project preparation facility at EBRD based in London, um, and I also work quite a bit on infrastructure policy, so I'll speak with both hats today. Firstly, let me thank um, the High Council um, for privatization and PPPs for inviting EBRD. Um, as many of you know, we're, we're quite new to the country. I, uh, we've only really had a presence here for about six months. So we're very, very um, interested and eager to become involved in the infrastructure sector. Um, uh, what I'll do is just in a couple of minutes run through um, PPPs and our experience to introduce you a little bit to EBRD and our approach. Um, I'll talk to you about our project preparation facility, the architecture of it, how it's working, why we think that's important. And then uh, specifically go a little bit deeper into risk mitigation, which I think for many of you, uh, the investors in the room, is, is um, something that's at the top of your mind, how to come into these projects with an appropriate risk uh, uh, allocation. So going through. EBRD um, has, as, as I'm sure those who, who know a bit about the institution, we have an orientation towards the private sector. Um, we've done over 50 PPPs, participated in financing in the last 20 or so year, years. Um, roads, facilities management, rail, hospitals, airports, wastewater. We cover um, a fairly broad spectrum. Um, within that, um, I thought it was important to, to show you that, that the bank, um, whilst we are a, a, a development institution, um, we also, we really specialize in uh, private sector, sub-sovereign, um, almost what one would call corporate utility lending with private sector principles, private sector um, pricing. Um, only about a third of our, of our projects in the infrastructure area are, are the standard traditional sovereign lending. The rest really is the sub-sovereign space, municipalities, utilities, state-owned enterprises, and indeed PPPs. Um, now, key lessons learned from, from our experience. I mean, the first thing to explain is that the, we're talking about here this realm of PPPs, which is a whole spectrum ranging from service contract, excuse me, management contracts, and then building from there in the kind of alphabet soup of design build, um, DBO, DBOM, DBFOM, DBFOMT, um, and BOO, BOT, et cetera. And as you build up, you're going from essentially, this, this slide is, is trying to show how the private sector increases its operational involvement as you move up the chain, but also its, its, um, its investment level, so on, on the, the um, bottom axis. Now the vertical axis, I want to show that, that risk as you move up that chain of PPPs, risk also increases for the private sector. And, 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 and with that risk, it's often accompanied by a, a longer term engagement. So there's a longer term duration to the contract. So, this is what happens as you build up experience and you go for deeper and deeper private sector involvement. Um, very quickly, the, the EBRD approach, if you will, is, is typically we start with a kind of a planning framework, support at the planning level, and usually we do in the very early days of many of our countries 20 years ago, it was sovereign lending. That was all that was allowed to be done. That was what the legal framework allowed. We then moved with them into sub-sovereign, lending with perhaps a sovereign guarantee. Then we moved to straight sub-sovereign without a sovereign guarantee, and then we got into a commercialized environment where tariffs and user charges and full sort of support with, with robust availability payment mechanisms, et cetera, um, allows one to then structure full PPPs at long-term duration. So it's that kind of pyramid and what's interesting, just for a, a pause, if you look around the world, countries, st even, even countries that are very mature in their PPP environments, take the UK for example, or Australia, um, really it's that top end of 10 to 15% of total investment which is being done as PPPs. The rest still is sub-sovereign or public sector sovereign. So, so it, it's important to keep that kind of balance in, in mind. Now, what are the key questions? Um, I think there are sort of, well, there's many, many reasons, uh, many issues to keep in mind, but three jump out always again and again for me. 
One, is the project that you're trying to do essential for the economy, for the society? So it, with essentiality comes political will. And, and when you have those in place, it's a much stronger, uh, uh, you have a much higher possibility of having that PPP be successful over the long term. Secondly, is there value for money versus the public sector alternative? What I mean for, by that is that, without getting too technical, but there's a, there's a value of the, of the risk transfer from the public sector to the private sector, and that value can be monetized in the, in, in, in the assessment. So apples to apples, is there on a net present value basis enough of a benefit of doing it as a PPP to outweigh the increased financing costs of, of, of the PPP structure versus the public sector alternative. So you've got to go through that exercise to really be sure that this is worth doing. Not all projects are, 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 are justified on a value for money basis. So, and finally, can you afford it? And if you can afford it, is there going to be political will and, and, and will at, the, at the, the willingness to pay by users and taxpayers? If there is, it's, it's something that you should do, but you need to do that, that double check to make sure. Now, the IPPF, this facility, 40 million euros um, from our net profits we put in.